Thank you, Jeff. I know you've had a lot thrown at you today, uh, but before we conclude um, the updates from us, I want to take a few minutes to make sure you see the connecting thread that runs through everything that we showed you today. And I have something new to share with you as well. The connective thread is the network. Fundamentally, we're a network company, whether it's smart cities, streaming video, software-defined networking, connected cars, or anything else, all those capabilities are enabled by a network. Now, traditionally, you might have thought of the network as just a wire connecting two machines, um, two people. More recently, we've expanded that a wireless tower connects you to the internet. And really, to some of our competitors, that's what building a network is really about. But when we talk about improving the network, what we mean is addressing more than wires and towers and devices. We're certainly doing those things as well, but our vision for the network is also much more than that. It's not just about connecting two points. It's also about adding those capabilities and intelligence onto the network. It's the services that run over that connection, not just the connection itself. And it's about the developers, you folks sitting here in the audience and watching around the world, who help us realize that vision. But first, let me give you a brief glimpse into what we've done to grow our networks since I stood here a year ago. David just mentioned a few of these new features now being used by our customers. HD voice, Wi-Fi calling, advanced messaging, and of course, video calling. Each of these innovations have two clear objectives, deliver a premium experience and make our daily connections easier. I'm also really happy to share that we hit a huge milestone to end 2015 with our Volte or VoiceOver LTE coverage. It now covers 295 million Americans and includes more than 27 million active users, more than any other U.S. carrier. We also launched last year AT&T's Number Sync. It's an innovation that links all of your compatible devices, that you, things that, like you saw today, to your primary mobile number. Just last month, we launched that capability on Samsung's Gear S2, and we plan for more devices here in the very near future. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't share that our software-defined network path is hitting huge milestones, too. Millions of wireless subscribers are running on a virtualized network, and our initial software-defined networking product that was introduced in early 2014 that we call Network on Demand is now used by more than 275 business customers around the world. We're doing this because our customers' expectations of what the network should be able to do are really exploding. They don't just want more bandwidth, they want better capabilities. Okay, so by now you're probably wondering, what does all this mean for developers and open source contributors? You heard some of that this morning. Before, our industry was built around a model where we specified we standardized, and then we implemented. That was the approach. But that's too slow and cumbersome to move at the pace that we need. While standards are still important, particularly in some of the regulated use cases around aviation and power, for example, but we need a more agile approach. At AT&T, we knew we had to think fundamentally differently. We needed to approach the problem with a different point of view, and to do so, we had to create a new ecosystem that thought similarly, something more suited for a networked, software-centric, open-source world. It's not necessarily a new concept, because we're taking some of these aspects that we do from web companies, to be honest. Um, so we're looking for a better balance between traditional standards processes and these agile software-driven open ecosystems. 
And it's a fundamental component of what we believe our solution needs to be. This past June, I, I placed a, a public stake in the ground and said that we plan to go from 5% to 50% in our use of open source um, software technology. But allow me to also take this moment to remind you that our current focus uh, with open source isn't new. In fact, AT&T has a long history of leading in this area. We were at the heart of Unix and C programming language, and both of those have spawned generations of programmers. In addition to building our own open source tools and platforms, we're also involved with many of the existing open source groups. And one of the tenets of the open source community is that you don't just take code, you contribute as well. We're heavily involved with almost all of the major open source efforts. Open Daylight, Open NF, NFV, Onos, OpenStack. On that last one, for instance, OpenStack, I'd like to share some updates on how we're using that platform because it's a really big deal for us. One of the key elements of our software-centric network is what we call AT&T Integrated Cloud, or AIC. These AIC nodes are physical locations around the world where we're running virtual network functions. So in other words, the AIC is how we're bringing the network, the entire network, into the cloud, and it's all based on OpenStack. So early in 2015, I said we plan to deploy 69 of these AIC nodes globally. And that, at the time, was a really ambitious goal. Believe me, my team was extremely nervous. It was like one of those, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. He said it. Um, well, I'm happy to announce that not only did we meet that goal, we beat it. We have AIC deployed in 74 locations globally, all built on OpenStack. Why is that a big deal? Well, AIC uses the same code base for both our enterprise apps, so us as a company, and our carrier workloads, that externally facing network. So it's flexible. The multiple locations also mean that we can place these facilities closer to where our customers are and contain security threats better. Hardware failures and other issues that occur in a single location can happen without endangering the other AIC locations. Our cloud strategy enables software-defined networking functions to be not only high performance and have low latency, but have better fault tolerance. And the global distribution means we can configure different AIC zones based on regulations, requirements of individual countries, and any region in which we operate. So it's very, not only very scalable, it's very configurable. So the cloud is central to our vision of where the network is going. And building that vision in OpenStack is part of our commitment to collaborating with the developer and open source communities. In turn, I ask that you, the developers, embrace cloud native application development. Build your apps with the cloud in mind. That's where the world is going, and it opens a new world of collaborative possibilities with companies like ours. And while OpenStack is a big part of our push, we're working with all of those other open source groups I just mentioned. OpenStack is just an example. We have employees contributing code to each of those groups, sitting on the boards of those groups, and leading those working groups. Our AT&T Foundry Innovation Centers they also collaborate very heavily with developers and entrepreneurs who we think can help us realize our network vision, particularly around our pivot to an exclusively software-defined network. And of course, our AT&T Labs team remains heavily involved in open source and the developer world in general. Again, our goal is not just to build a network that connects point A to point B, but a smart, adaptable, and evolving network that enables these new capabilities like you saw today, in addition to the basic connectivity that we increasingly take for granted. And our open source engagement also crosses into the growing big data world as well. Our AT&T Labs team 
recently created an open source programming language called rCloud to make it easier for developers to do big data analytics. It's won several awards and it continues to see uh, very frequent and, and uh, explosive growth in downloads. AT&T Labs has also created an open source big data visualization tool that we call NanoCubes. NanoCubes gives you real-time visualization of large data sets that you track over time, and you can format those results as heat maps, bar charts, and many, many other ways. And it's also viewable in a standard web browser, so it's easy. It's a very cool way of making sense of very large chunks of data, thinking millions or even billions of records at a glance. In addition to big data, the network is also at the heart of the Internet of Things. We're doing a lot of work internally on this front. You saw some of the work earlier in the Red Bull demonstration. But a year ago, for example, we launched our M2X data service, which is a cloud-based data storage service for the enterprise IoT developers um, to enable companies to collect, analyze, and share data securely over our network. And then Flow Designer, the cloud-based tool to help developers quickly create these IoT apps, get high reuse. It's an innovation that came out of our AT&T foundry location in Israel. But we can't make this IoT ecosystem work on our own. We need you. We need the developers. We need developers, particularly in the open source community, to step up in some critical areas if IoT is going to be successful. One of the most critical areas is interoperability. You've seen a lot of great IoT products and concepts and prototypes today. Smart homes, smart cars, and even smart cities. That's a lot of devices chattering back and forth. We're building a network that can enable all that chatter, but we also have to think about how all those devices talk to each other and talk to devices from different manufacturers across different networks in different parts of the world. We know that most consumers and most businesses aren't going to buy all of their IoT devices from a single supplier running on a single network. We need to establish a common architecture that allows these devices to securely share their data with other devices and software applications. These devices have to be able to talk to each other if we want this technology to work seamlessly. We think the open source community is uniquely positioned to enable this, free from concerns about a single vendor having lock-in. One such effort that's underway now is with the open source group Open Daylight. ODL recently started a project called the Internet of Things Data Management Project around this very effort. We're using Open Daylight in our SDN initiative, and we're also supporting this IoT project. More importantly, we need you, the developer community, to support it as well. I'm sure we'll see other similar efforts from some of the other open source groups out there, and we'll look into those as well. But while AT&T has a lot of resources we can contribute, we know that the innovation that independent developers like you bring is vital to how this works. And so with that in mind, let me leave you with one final new development for us. One of the hallmarks of our collaborative spirit, and a lot of it with developers in recent years, has been through our AT&T Foundry. We've mentioned it here before. You've heard me mention it a few prior years. Um, so from SDN to the Internet of Things to big data to cybersecurity, the AT&T Foundry is where we work with the developers, but also we bring the end customers and then our internal business units where, and turn ideas into working prototypes to just see if they can work, and then into launch products and ultimately into the services that we launch into the market, and we're doing that faster than we ever could before. So we currently have five AT&T Foundry locations, Silicon Valley, a couple in Dallas, Atlanta, and Israel. 
And today I'm thrilled to announce that we're expanding with a new AT&T Foundry location opening soon in Houston. This facility will be called AT&T Foundry for Connected Health. And it will be co-located with one of the premier medical innovation centers in the world, the Texas Medical Center Innovation Institute. It's on the campus of Texas Medical Center. This facility will work hand in hand with our existing foundries in Dallas that are dedicated to the Internet of Things. What's great about this facility is that it has a chance to not just accelerate business and the technology needs, but to quickly improve people's lives. Heard a lot about that from the panel this morning. This is about speed. We'll be exploring new technologies like smart wheelchairs, remote patient diagnostics, the tools. We'll have a lot more to share in the coming weeks, but the opportunity is huge. And we'll be looking to the developer community to help us turn this opportunity into a reality. So to conclude, there's a lot going on at AT&T. It's all built around our network, about bringing new capabilities onto that network, not just about making pipes bigger. And as cool as some of these near-term network capabilities are, we think there's some really amazing stuff not too far down the road. I'm really excited about what's ahead for us in 2016 and look forward to sharing more with you very, very soon. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with you to make all of this that you saw today really stand up and become a reality. So to close the show, let me welcome back to the stage my friend and partner, Ralph De La Vega. Mm -hmm.